Hello, it's Paul Beckwith again. So, in the last video, I was talking about the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, and their report that just came out. And um, they have all these different metrics on, they come out with their state of the climate report every year, and they have all of these metrics on how things are changing. So, I talked about some of the highlights or lowlights of the report in the last video, and now I'm going to get into more of the nitty gritty, focusing on the images and plots. So this is my website, paulbeckwith.net. So please check it out if you haven't seen it. And in both Facebook and Twitter, um, I've been sharing this article from BBC about climate change impacts accelerating. This article was just published yesterday and it refers to this WMO report so that's in both Facebook and in Twitter okay um, here we go so that, that's what I'm focusing on in the last video I talked about some of the highlights which are these global um, climate indicators Glo this is global climate observing system GCOS sponsored by the WMO and other groups, UN, science councils, etc. So I talked about the indicators, and now I'll focus on the WMO report, which came out. So the state of the global climate in 2018. And I'm just gonna focus on, I, I suggest, I highly recommend that you get this report and have a look on your computer as you, as you follow along this video. So 2018 was the fourth warmest year on record. 2015, 16, 17, 18 were the four warmest years on record as the long-term warming trend continued. Ocean heat content is at a record high. A paper came out even say, recently saying it was 40% higher than we thought before. Global sea, mean sea level continues to rise as the ocean is warming. There's a steric component. It's, it, the water's just expanding, so that raise, rises, raises sea level. And not to mention, and there's also mass added, there's water added, converted from the ice on glaciers, both in the, at high altitude regions and at the two poles, the, the water, the ice on Greenland and Antarctica, when it melts, it goes into the sea, raising sea level. Arctic and Antarctic sea ice extent is well below average. I showed how Antarctic basically dipped a huge amount in the last few years. The jet streams are distorted, they're slower, they're wavier, they're um, much, they're, they're, they're persistent and getting stuck, so we're getting a huge ramping up of extreme weather events, an increase in frequency, severity, and duration, and also they're happening in locations where they didn't before. Now, it says the average global temperature reached about one degree above pre-industrial, but again, there's a sliding baseline issue, so it's actually you know, if you take pre-industrial being 1750, this number is more like 1.5. We're not on track to meet climate targets and rain and temperature increases. Every fraction of a degree of warming makes a difference. Now let's focus on the diagram. So I'll zip through here. So here's the global mean temperature difference from 1850 to 1900. Okay, so that's the 1850 to 1900, the average baseline, that's what the numbers are relative to, and we've got the Hadley data, NOAA data, the Goddard Institute of Space Science, which is a branch of NOAA data, the European data, and the Japanese data, and if you plot all these, you can see this type of thing happening, so the scale here, you know, this reached at about 1.2, this is now, in order to relate this to the 1750 temperature, which was the original definition of pre-industrial, you need to add 0 0.3 degrees, so that one point, that becomes 1.5 almost. Okay, um, the distribution of the surface air temperature, this is the temperature anomaly for 2018 relative to the 1981 to 2010 average. So there's already a lot of climate change that has happened by this time. Okay, so it would be better to look at, you know, to ha have it related to averages going back and even to 1750 to see what's going on. But anyway, um, what you can see, of course, is the Arctic has huge warming. I mean, up to 10 degrees Celsius warming over the Arctic. 
You can see a cold area here. You can see a few cold areas. But what you can see is, interestingly, you know, North America here was very cold. And as we get less and less sea ice, I would expect maybe this um, pattern to continue because the jet stream, the center of cold is no longer, will no longer be the North Pole, but it'll be the centered on Greenland. Um, so I think it could shift the whole thing and we might expect this um, moving forward very frequently. Now, this, the state of the climate indicators and some of the key components, this is a very good diagram. So you have changes in the energy budget, the atmosphere and ocean temperature heat content, uh, changes in the atmospheric composition, the greenhouse gases, the CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, water vapor, aerosols. You get changes in weather, extreme weather events, and you get changes in the hydrological cycle river discharge, lakes, precipitation, okay, changing clouds, okay. So there's all these different components. There's the cryosphere, the ice sheets, there's the bios, the, so changes in the cryosphere, snow cover on the ground, frozen ground or permafrost, sea ice, ice sheets, glaciers, okay. Um, changes in the land surface, vegetation, there's huge human influence. Um, changes in the biosphere and, and each of these systems and in the hydrosphere, each of these systems and in the lithosphere, each of these systems is interacting and there's feedbacks amongst them. Um, you know, there, so atmosphere, biosphere interaction, land atmosphere interaction, land cryosphere interaction, land ocean, ocean cryosphere. Okay, each one is connected to each other one. Um, volcanic activity here, um, sea ice, ice ocean coupling, okay, there's heat exchanges, wind stress, terrestrial radiation, precipitation, evaporation, and so on. Okay, so there's changes, changes in any one of these things causes changes via feedbacks into the other systems. So these are some of the key um, state of the climate indicators, if you like, used by WMO to track climate variability. So temperature and energy, of surface temperature, ocean heat, atmospheric compensation. There's a number of typos in this report, by the way, that they should correct. Atmospheric CO2, ocean acidification, and sea level rise, uh, cryosphere, the glaciers, Arctic and Antarctic sea ice extent. Okay, if you click on this link, um, then that gives you the climate indicators that I talked about in the previous video. Okay, so I'll just go down. Now, this is a key um, image which is updated every um, every year, basically, in this report. And we've got CO2, the actual level of CO2 in parts per million from, from uh, you know, uh, late early 80s to present day. And the rise is going upward. We've got the methane. And the rise, 2007, you know, it tapered off here and then started a quick rise in 2007 and nitrous oxide on, on a pretty steady increase upward. Now, if you take the derivative or the slope of these curves, then this is uh, what you get for the slope of these curves. Okay, the slope is changing. This is the yearly growth rate, if you like, or the change in each year of CO2. What you can see here is you've reached over three parts per million here, you know, approaching three here. You know, I think, I believe in 2018, it's about 2.7 or something, or 2.8. This is a methane uh, growth rate. So dropped to close to zero and then picked up again in 2007. And this is the nitrous oxide growth rate. Okay, so the greenhouse gases are going ever upward. Now, there's uh, they talked about blue carbon. So, so coastlines that absorbed lots of CO2. So things like mangroves, tidal salt marshes, and seagrass meadows. Okay, so in the images here. So on coastlines, these are important sinks for carbon dioxide. So we've got the mangroves here which are growing in the salt water. They, the roots are very good shelter for a lot of fish. You've got the, um, the marshlands, the saltwater marshlands here, sequester lots of carbon. That's the, the, the thick blue line coming down. And seagrasses here also absorb lots of carbon. The arrow up is the respiration of these plants. When there's no light, plants respire, like uh, 
like organisms, like like animals. And this is what's happening with, um, you know, when when there's changes of the coastline and there's no longer mangroves, the the organic matter decays, produces lots of CO2. Same with the marshes when they're filled in, when they're drained, etc. And uh, the water temperatures are higher, so the seagrasses are fewer and fewer, and also kelp, which is not shown here, is a bit off the coastline, but it's a huge sink for carbon dioxide, and off Tasmania in particular, we've lost most of the kelp because the water temperature is too high, so that's losing sinks. So there's lots of carbon storage potential in coastal and marine ecosystems. As sea level, level rises, of course, it changes these coastlines, and affects the carbon that can be stored in these um, areas. So it, so the number is the extent, the sequestration rates, how much carbon per hectare per year of these different things here, the total carbon sequestered annually, and the stability and things like that. Okay, so those are shown here. There's lots of good information. Um, the rise in atmospheric CO2 of course, causes climate change, the global carbon cycle 2008 to 2017. Here's the numbers. This is the CO2 going up into the atmosphere from fossil fuel emissions. It's in gigatons of CO2 per year. 34 here, land use changes. Okay, if you cut down forests and, and you create um, plantations for, for getting palm oil, palm trees, um, then you lose a lot of the carbon that was in the trees, etc. So land use changes is, a, is putting CO2 in the atmosphere. The biosphere is absorbing CO2. Um, but if you get rid of lots of the biosphere, lots of the plants, then there's less and less being taken out of the air. Atmospheric CO2 levels, um, this is from 2008 to 2017, up 17.3. Oceans absorbing lots of CO2, but again, if these sinks start failing, then there's more and more CO2 that is up into the atmosphere. So um, the fossil fuel emissions, it's from gas, oil, coal. Um, of course, permafrost, there's exchanges, but as we get warming, there's less carbon that can be stored in permafrost and, and uh, biological decomposition breaks down the permafrost producing CO2 if oxygen is available or methane if uh, no oxygen or little oxygen is available. Of course, soils are a big sink and uh, you know, the oceans, okay? So these are the, this is the global carbon budget. Um, this is the balance of the sources and sinks. So over time, 1900 to present, fossil carbon way, way up. Land use changes, you know, is fluctuated. The oceans sink, more and more CO2 has to go into the oceans. The land sink and the more and more is going into the atmosphere. Okay, and that's causing, that's mostly the, the changes that we see. This is the ozone hole area. So 2018 is the red line. Um, the envelope is 79 to 2017 and there's fluctuations, but the ozone hole is still there. Um, this is ocean heat content. Daily sea surface temperature anomalies. Um, this is on a particular day, January 29, 2018, with respect to the 87 to 2005 average. So sea surface temperature difference um, from 87 to 2005. And you can see the areas, huge warming um, just to the southeast of Australia, encompassing New Zealand. Marine heat waves, massive here, you know, some warming here, warming up here as the Gulf Stream uh, changes location. But there's a huge problem here that's destroyed a lot of the kelp, a lot of the sea grasses, a lot of the carbon sinks. Deoxygen deoxygenation of open ocean and coastal waters is a problem with deoxygenation. You can get... Um, hydrogen sulfide emitted. I'll do a separate whole separate video on that. It's a very serious issue. But these are areas where deficient or low in oxygen and these are hy so hypoxic areas. The oxygen concentration is less than two milligrams per liter of water. And you can see that around a lot of coastlines there's a lot of um, problems with the ocean 